Hello everybody, and welcome to Chemistry 103. This is the final chapter in your textbook, chapter 12, Acids and Bases. This will be the final lecture in of the course. Um, I will also be including, after this, a brief bonus lecture on the introduction to organic chemistry for anybody who is planning on going on to take that course. It's also useful to make the bridge between general chemistry and biology because a lot of biological molecules are organic molecules and understanding even the basics of how those operate can be very helpful in your future in the sciences. But for the most part, today we're going to focus on acids and bases, which is going to take the ideas that we've covered in the past two chapters concerning solutions and equilibrium, and also apply our knowledge of ionic compounds, and we're going to roll them all together into the discussion of types of reactions that involve acids and bases and their various properties and properties such as pH, which is a fundamental measurement in chemistry. So to start off, we're going to define acids. So acids are among the most common and important compounds. They're fairly ubiquitous in most chemical reactions because even reactions that don't directly involve acids can be catalyzed by an acidic environment. And Acids mainly occur in aqueous solutions, which are very important for biological systems, and also in many industrial chemical processes. The characteristics of acids include the sour taste of lemons and vinegar, which is important in food chemistry. Also, acids are what digest the food in our stomachs, and namely hydrochloric acid. And acids also dissolve many metals, which then create salts and hydrogen gas, which can be used for other purposes. The largest quantity of any chemical produced in the United States is sulfuric acid, which is interesting. It's a very useful solvent for dissolving metals and also can be used in the production of gunpowder. So an acid, when dissolved in water, will generate H plus ions and an anion, which is the negatively charged ion of whatever the proton is bound to. Uh, for example, hydrochloric acid, which is a gas, can be dissolved in water, and it will dissociate into aqueous hydrogen plus ions and aqueous chloride ions. Now, the H plus that is generated in the solution will give it a sour taste right before it burns your tongue off. Uh, this is the same sour taste that is generated by vinegar, which is acetic acid, or lemon juice, which is primarily citric acid, which are much weaker acids than hydrochloric acid. Um, many of the acids that we'll encounter are what are known as oxo acids. These will also generate H plus ions, but will generally consist of a nonmetal bound to a number of oxygen atoms, such as nitric acid, which is HNO3. This is a liquid in its pure phase, and when it is mixed with water, it produces H plus ions and nitrate ions. Now, oxo acids are characterized by an acidic hydrogen attached to an oxygen, and these are generally the acids of polyatomic ions. Now another type of acid is something called an organic acid. Now these are an acid with a carbon backbone or a carboxyl group, and that is shown in this picture here. You have carbon double bonded to an oxygen and then single bonded to another oxygen, which is then attached to an acidic hydrogen. This hydrogen readily dissociates in solution from this molecule, leaving behind a negatively charged carbon-oxygen moiety. And then this carbon group can be any carbon chain or group of carbon chains. And the simplest one is acetic acid, which where there's just one carbon with three hydrogens attached. 
and its formula is sometimes represented as CH3C with the two oxygens and then H for the acidic hydrogen, or sometimes written this way with the acidic hydrogen out front and then the C2H3O2 to account for the rest of the atoms in the molecule. That is the carboxyl group being circled. So, just as with any new kind of compound, we need to learn the naming schemes of acids, which help us to delineate them from one another. So, we use the prefix hydro before the root name of the element that is made, that makes up the acid. And then we add the suffix IC and the word acid to the root name for the element. Examples are hydrochloric acid, which is the binary acid of the chlorine atom, and hydroiodic acid, which is the binary acid of the iodine atom, or iodide ion. Now, when we're naming oxo acids, we, these produce H plus and a polyatomic ion when dissolved in water, and they generally are composed of hydrogen, oxygen, and a non-metal. You use the root name of the polyatomic ion in the name of the acid. So if it ends in 8, you use the suffix IC and then acid. And then if it ends in ite, you use the suffix OUS and acid. So for example, sulfuric acid is the acid formed from the sulfate ion and two hydrogen plus cations. And sulfurous acid is the acid made from the sulfite ion and two positively charged hydrogens. Now, bases are compounds that when dissolved in water will generate OH minus anions and a metal cation. So, for instance, sodium hydroxide, NaOH, it's a solid. When it's dissolved in water, it produces sodium cations in aqueous and OH minus anions in aqueous. These are sometimes called alkalis and the OH minus group, when it's in aqueous, will give a bitter taste. And sometimes it will cause things to feel slippery like soap. Because soap is produced from mixture, mixing a strong base with fat molecules. Most bases are composed of elements from group 1 and 2A, which are the alkaline earth and alkaline metals. And the OH ion is usually referred to as the hydroxide ion. Most bases are ionic compounds simply because ionic compounds are the substances that dissociate readily in water. However, there are some nitrogen compounds that are organic that you may learn about in the future that can act as bases or acids depending on the, the environment they find themselves in. The hydroxide ion obviously has a charge of minus one. And these bases are named according to the cation that they are composed of, followed by the word hydroxide. So, for instance, sodium hydroxide is NaOH, potassium hydroxide is KOH, calcium hydroxide is CaOH2, and ammonium hydroxide is NH4OH. Now, these types of, these delineations between acids and bases were first recognized by a man named Arrhenius, and so they are called Arrhenius acids and bases. And Arrhenius acids produce hydrogen plus ions in water, and bases produce hydroxide ions in water. Now, this is a basic definition that works for most of the common bases and acids. However, there are a number of acidic and basic properties that cannot be accounted for by this simple model. And so there's another model that we talk about in chemistry called the Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases. So the limitations of the Arrhenius model are that they only apply to aqueous solutions. And the other big issue is that free hydrogen cations do not exist in water. So... Instead, we define an acid as any substance that can donate a proton, H+, to another substance, and we call this a proton donor. 
and a base is therefore any substance that can accept a proton from another substance or a proton acceptor. Now this brings in the idea of water as a base. So H plus does not exist in water because the strong attraction of the polar water molecule causes the H plus to become bound to water molecules. And this is seen in the example of hydrochloric acid dissolving in water. The H plus ion is attached to, attracted to one of the lone pairs on oxygen and forms a covalent bond, which then leaves behind a positively charged H3O plus ion and the negatively charged chloride ion. This is how protons generally exist in water. And this is called hydronium. You may have heard of hydronium before. And um, there's another molecule, H2O5, which is, or H5O2, which is two water molecules bound to one proton, which is sometimes observed, but only under special conditions. So in the Bronsted Lowry model, whenever you have an acid interacting with a base, the acid dissociates or donates a proton to the base to form a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. This reaction involves a proton transfer. So an acid will lose its proton to form a conjugate base, which is called a conjugate base because it could in turn accept a proton back again in a reverse reaction. Now the base will accept the proton to form the conjugate acid, which can then in turn donate a proton back to the base or another base and have a reverse reaction occur. And obviously some sort of equilibrium will be established in which the reverse reaction is equal to the forward reaction and that will help us establish an equilibrium model for such base acid-base reactions. So in the case of hydrochloric acid and water, we have hydrochloric acid is the acid, we have water as the base, and then we have H3O plus as the conjugate acid, meaning the um, after the basic water has accepted a proton from HCl, it becomes a conjugate acid, which could then donate its proton back to a negatively charged anion or base. And then the chloride is the conjugate base. And I just said the HCl is donating a proton, mixing it the Bronsted-Lowry acid, and the water molecule is the Bronsted-Lowry base. Now, this brings up the idea of conjugate acid-base pairs, which are related to each other by the donation of a single proton. Now, the acid is the part that is the one that has the proton attached, and the base pair does not. Every acid has a conjugate base, meaning any acid can be deprotonated to form a conjugate base, and every base can be protonated to form a conjugate acid. Conjugate is given to the part of the pair that is produced in the reaction, so it's a product, and reactants are the acids and bases. So, an example of conjugate acid base pairs ammonia in water forming ammonium and hydroxide ions. In this case, ammonia is a base because it accepts a proton from water, which acts as the acid. And then NH4 plus becomes the conjugate acid because it could give up its proton to a base. And hydroxide is the conjugate base because it could accept a proton from an acid. So each acid is related to a base on the opposite side of the arrow. And if you're in the reactant side, then you don't have the word conjugate in front of acid or base. And if you're on the product side, you do have the word conjugate. So some examples, which of the following represent conjugate acid base pairs. The first one is you have H2O and H3O plus. You, second one is you have OH minus and HNO3. Third is H2SO4 and SO4 two minus. And Four is HC2H3O2 and C2H3O2 minus. And we can talk about these. The first one 
H2O and H3O plus. That is a conjugate acid base pair because H2O is protonated to form H3O plus. However, number two, OH minus and HNO3 are not acid base pairs because OH minus is not produced by the dissociation of HNO3, nor can it be produced by accepting a proton. Now, this one's a bit tricky. You would think because H2SO4 and SO4 2 minus dissociates to form two protons that it would be the conjugate acid base pair, but in fact, the, it's the loss of a single proton that makes something an acid. So in this case, they're not pairs because the pair would actually be H2SO4 to HSO4 minus and one proton. And then the last one, this is acetic acid. So acetic acid is deprotonated to form the acetate ion, which makes this a conjugate acid base pair because of the production of one proton. Now, this brings in the concept of strength of acids because obviously not all substances that dissociate in water will dissociate to the same extent. So when an acid dissolves in water, it gives its proton to water to form the conjugate base of the acid and a hydronium ion, and the strength of the acid is determined by the amount of H3O plus that is produced. So in the reaction shown at the bottom, you have HA, which is typically used to designate a protonated acid, which is an aqueous, and then water, which is a liquid, and it dissociates to form H3O plus and negatively charged anion in aqueous. Now, strong acids will dissociate in nearly 100%, and therefore they have very weak conjugate bases. Meaning, This means that the reverse reaction will be very slow and mostly conjugate base and H3O plus will exist in solution. This means the forward reaction will predominate, as shown in the reaction below. Now, weak acids don't dissociate very much and they therefore have stronger conjugate bases and these conjugate bases react readily with H3O plus to hold on to H plus ions and therefore the reverse reaction predominates. Now this property can be useful in tuning chemical reactions but first we have to talk about the equilibrium between these two processes. So just like with other equilibrium processes that we've talked about, there is a dissociation constant associated with it, or an equilibrium constant. This one's referred to as the acid dissociation constant. And in a weak acid, the rate of dissociation of the acid is equal to the rate of the association. So when these two processes happen, the equal rate is when equilibrium has established and therefore we can write an equilibrium expression for this process. So we say that the acid dissociation constant Ka is equal to the hydronium ion concentration times the concentration of the anion conjugate base, and this is divided by the concentration of the undissociated acid. Here's an example using formic acid, which is a very simple acid made of the formate ion. It's the acid found in bee and ant stings. It has the formula HCHO2, and when it's mixed with water, it dissociates to form H3O plus and CHO2 minus. So the equilibrium expression is indicated as H3O plus times CHO2 minus, and these brackets indicate concentration, and then concentration of formal formic acid undissociated um, in the denominator. This constant is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4. So, this is a summary of acid characteristics. For a strong acid, the equilibrium position is shifted towards products or fully ionized molecules. Weak acids are have the equilibrium shifted towards reactants, which are non-ionized. Strong acids have a large Ka value. Weak acids have a small one. And strong acids have 
H3O plus and A minus concentrations of 100% of the initial concentration of acid, whereas in a weak acid, these ions will be a small percentage of the initial hydrogen high protonated acid concentration. Strong acids have weak conjugate bases, and weak acids have strong conjugate bases. And a number of acid dissociation constants for weak acids are shown here. Phosphoric acid, H3PO4, has a dissociation constant of 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3, which is still fairly high, which it's, this is a, an acid that's prevalent in your own body because phosphate reactions are essential for most biochemical processes. Other things like hydrofluoric acid are used in chemical etching. And then there's a number of common acids that occurred here. Car carbonic acid is the, also is the dissolved form of carbon dioxide in your blood. Um, and bicarbonate ions are present in baking soda. Acetic acid is vinegar. Formic acid we just talked about. And some of the lower ones here have um, very low dissociation constants down around 10 to the minus 13. So we're going to move on with another example. Write the Ka for hydrogen sulfide gas. So first you have to write the equation for the dissociation of H2S gas, which is you bubble hydrogen sulfide gas into water. It becomes dissolved and it dissociates to form H3O plus ions and HS minus. So we set up our Ka expression for this and the Ka is the concentration of hydroxide ions times the concentration of the conjugate acid, which is HS minus, divided by the concentration of the undissociated acid, which in this case is H2S, and that's your expression. We can write one now for hypochlorous acid, which is the dissolved form of chlorine. This is the acid form of bleach. If it was nitrogen, if it was sodium hypochlorite, it would be liquid bleach. Well, it would be dissolved in water and it would be liquid bleach. This molecule is produced by your immune system to help fight disease. So, the, first we write the equation for the dissociation of the weak acid. We have HClO in water. This dissociates to form hydronium ions and hypochlorite. And then we set up our equilibrium expression. So, on the numerator, or we have the concentration of hydronium and the concentration of hypochlorite. And then we have in the denominator the hypochlorous acid concentration. Now, there are other types of acids called polyprotic acids, which can donate more than one proton. And these are usually weak acids, with the exception of sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid. Some weak acids include phosphoric acid or carbonic acid, and these are very biologically relevant. So, one weak acid is carbonic acid. It is a diprotic acid, and it partially dissociates in water, giving up one proton at a time. So the first dissociation is H2CO3 in aqueous plus water, dissociates to form hydronium and HCO3 minus, which is the bicarbonate anion. However, HCO3 minus is also a weak acid, and it can undergo a second dissociation to produce another hydronium ion and the carbonate ion. And both of these processes will be in equilibrium at the same time. Now, a diprotic strong acid, or the only diprotic strong acid, is, is sulfuric acid. It completely dissociates in water to form H uh, H3O plus and HSO4 minus. Now... HSO4- minus is a weak acid, and it can undergo a second dissociation to produce another hydronium ion and the sulfate ion. And it will not necessarily do these, this to a large extent, but under certain conditions it can be driven to. 
So here are a summary of strong and weak acids and bases. In the acid family, some strong acids include nitric acid, HNO3, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, HCl, and also HBr and HI, but not HF. HF is a weak acid. Um, perchloric acid, HClO4, and chloric acid, HClO3, are strong acids, but um, chlorous acid and hypochlorous acid are weak base, weak acids. Most acids are weak acids. However, there may be a situation in which you encounter an acid that is incredibly strong for some ridiculous reason. There are things called super acids, which will basically protonate anything, and but they will always be labeled with severe warnings about how dangerous they are. And then bases, most group one and two metal hydroxides will be strong bases. And then there aren't very many weak bases other than ammonia or ammonium hydroxide. However, there are a number of organic molecules that act as weak bases that you may encounter and they become important in biochemistry. So we're going to do a quick study check here. Identify each of the following as a strong or weak acid or base. First one is HBr. Second one is HNO2. Third one is NaOH, sodium hydroxide. B is uh, nitrous acid. H2SO4, sulfuric acid, and ammonia, NH3. So HBr is a strong acid because it is one of the halides. HNO3 is a weak acid. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. H2SO4 is a strong acid, and NH3 is a weak base. So, this now we have to talk about the ionization of water because if water is being protonated and deprotonated, that means that it can act as either an acid or a base. This makes it something called an amphoteric substance. And in nature, water molecule, water, any sample of water will always have some amount of the water dissociated into H3O plus and OH minus. Um, in this case, water acts as both the base and the acid, and therefore the conjugate acid is hydronium and the conjugate base is OH-. So a small sample of any, a small percentage of any sample of pure water will have these ions present, um, and they're always present in equal amounts. This is referred to as auto-ionization, and it's generally quantified at 25 degrees Celsius. It doesn't occur to a large extent, but it occurs just enough to establish a constant based on it. And we say that the concentration of both hydronium and hydroxide ions is equal to 10 to the minus 7 molar. So in one mole of water, 10 to the minus 7 particles will be, or, or, sorry, uh, in one liter of water, there will be um, 10 to the minus 7 moles of these ions present. So if the concentration of these two ions is constant at 25 degrees Celsius in pure water, we will then say that the product of those two concentrations is equal to the water, the ion product water constant, which is equal to 10 to the minus 14. Uh, this is a basic reaction constant. Water is a liquid. The two ions are not, so they're the only thing that comes into the equilibrium expression. And since they both have the same concentration in pure water, then we say that this is the standard. But it also becomes valid in water with solutes, which is how we can establish a metric for the dissociation of acids and bases. So, one of the features of this ratio being constant is that if you increase the hydronium ion concentration, 
or the H plus concentration, then you have to decrease the concentration of hydroxide to compensate to keep the, the equilibrium constant constant. And vice versa, if you increase the hydroxide concentration, then you have to decrease the H plus concentration. So acids are substances that generally increase the number of H plus ions in solution. And all acidic solutions have a higher H plus concentration than OH minus concentration. Likewise, a base is a substance that will increase the concentration of OH minus ions in solution, and all basic solutions will have a higher OH minus concentration than H plus concentration. So a neutral solution has the concentrations of the two ions equal to one another. An acidic solution has more hydronium ions, and a basic solution has more hydroxide ions. But in all cases, the product of the concentrations is equal to 10 to the minus 14. So we're going to do some examples now. Calculate the high H plus concentration in a solution in which the OH co minus concentration is 2 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. Is this solution acidic, basic, or neutral? So first we know we set up our solubility product constant. We know that the product of the two concentrations is equal to 10 to the minus 14. We know what the concentration of hydroxide is. Then we can divide the t one by the other. And we deduce that the concentration of hydrox of H plus is 5 times 10 to the minus 13 molar which makes this solution basic because the hydroxide concentration is higher than the H plus concentration. So now that we have defined the water constant and the, constant, the idea of the concentration of the two ions of water, we can now talk about pH. So because of the fact that H plus concentrations have such a wide range of values from extremely large to extremely small, it become, can become difficult and inconvenient to work with these numbers over such a large range. For example, the concentration of 10 molar H plus and the concentration of 10 to the minus 14 molar H plus, that is a difference of a hundred and trillion, 100, a thousand trillion times. So we use a pH scale to make these numbers more, smaller and more manageable. And we define any p scale as a it's a log based unit so if you have n things then pn is the negative log of n so take the log of a number multiply it by minus 1 and so therefore ph is the negative log of the molar hydrogen ion concentration or negative log H plus. So the solution of this is the power of 10 of the that is relevant to the concentration. So I'm sure you've all solved logarithms before. Um, 10 to the power of the logarithm is equal to, or sorry, rather, the logarithm is, is the number to which you would raise 10 to the power of in order to get the concentration. So, to calculate the pH of a solution, you take the negative log of the H plus concentration, and this is where significant figures can get a little ha hairy. So you use, you count the number of decimal places of the logarithm as the number of sig figs in the original concentration. For example, if you have a hydrogen plus concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 4 molar, then the pH is minus the log of 1 times 10 to the minus 4, which is negative of negative 4, which is 4. So this solution will have a pH of 4. And notice the original concentration had two significant figures, and the pH result has two decimal places. So we're going to do some examples. 
What is the pH of each of the following solutions? The first one has an H plus concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, and the second one has a concentration, an OH minus concentration of 5.0 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. So the first one is pretty straightforward. We, the pH is the negative of the log of the hydrogen ion concentration, so negative the log of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3. Uh, the logarithm is equal to minus 3, and therefore the pH is 3. In the second one, we have to use our knowledge of the water constant to figure out the concentration of hydrogen plus. So we know that the product of H plus and OH minus concentrations is 10 to the minus 14, and we know that the OH minus concentration is 5.0 times 10 to the minus 5. So we set up our relationship and we solve for H plus. So we divide 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 by 5.0 times 10 to the minus 5. And this gives us 2.0 times 10 to the minus 10. And then we take the negative log of that and we get that the log is equal to negative 9.7. And we negate that to get a pH of 9.7, which is a basic solution. So the pH is a log scale, which means that a change in one unit mean, it equals a tenfold increase or decrease in, P, in H plus concentration. Um, this is also known as an order of magnitude increase or decrease. Every time the exponent changes by one, the pH changes by one. Now, if you lower the pH, this increases the H plus concentration. So a small pH is an acidic solution and a large pH is a basic solution with a neutral solution being a pH of seven. And you can measure pH using either a pH meter, which is an electrical device that measures the pH of a solution by measuring the voltage that the H plus ions produce at a glass. And then you can use pH paper, which has chemicals that change color depending on the pH of the solution. And usually these are some kind of dye that has a different color in various pH solutions. Now, Concurrent with the pH scale is something called the pOH scale, which, as you can imagine, measures the OH minus concentration. Uh, so it's the opposite of the pH scale. A low OH minus is a high pOH, and a high OH minus concentration is a low pOH. So if you have an OH minus concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 4, then, of course, the pH will be 4 because it's just like pH. And the sum of the pH and the pOH is always 14, because the con water constant has an exponent of 14, or minus 14. So now that you have all these values, you can convert between them relatively easily um, to get each of them. So if you have H plus concentration and you need to get OH minus concentration, you have to, div you have to divide the water constant by the OH minus or divide the water constant by H plus. And if you want to get the pH, you take the negative log. If you want the pOH, you have to calculate the OH and then take the negative log. You can switch between pOH and pH by subtracting from 14. And if you want the concentration from the pH of the pOH, you take 10 to the power of the pH, of the negative pH. This is a scale that just shows pictorially the increases and decreases of various quantities in acidic and basic solutions. So H3O plus concentration starting at 10 to the 0 or 1 molar has a pH of 0, a pOH of 14, and an OH minus concentration of 10 to the minus 14. And as you increase in pH, the concentration of H3O plus goes down, the concentration of OH minus goes up until you reach pH 14, which has an H3O plus concentration of 10 to the minus 14 and an OH minus concentration of one molar and a pOH of zero. Now for extremely strong acids and bases, sometimes you can go to P negative pHs or pOHs. However, this is very uncommon and usually not encountered. Obviously neutral is pH of seven.
So here is a real world example. A sample of rain in an area with severe pollution has a pH of 3.5. What is the pOH of this rainwater? So we know that pAOH plus pH is equal to 14, and we were given the pH, so we subtract that from 14 to get the pOH, which is equal to 10.5. So we can also calculate the hydronium ion concentration of this rainwater by using the fact that the pH is equal to the negative log of the H plus concentration. So in order to calculate this, we have to take the inverse log of negative 3.5, which is equal, equivalent to taking 10 to the power of the negative pH. And this gives us an H plus concentration of 3.16 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. Another example, the pOH of a liquid drain cleaner was found to be 10.5. What is the OH minus concentration for this cleaner? We know from before that our pOH is equal to the negative log of our hydroxide ion concentration, and this is equal to 10.5. So we make, solve this problem by taking the negative sign to the other side and taking the inverse logarithm, which is equal to taking 10 to that power. And so we get an OH minus concentration of 3.16 times 10 to the minus 11 molar. So this is an acidic drain cleaner. Now, it's fairly easy to calculate the pH of a strong acid because strong acids dissociate nearly 100%, meaning that the solution will contain mostly H plus and the anion of whatever acid. So in order to find the concentration of the pH of the ion, you just take, it's just equal to the concentration of the original acid, and then you can find the pH from this. So for instance, if you have 5.0 times 10 to the minus third molar HCl solution, you can calculate the pH by assuming that this is completely dissociated and that therefore you have a one to one mole ratio. So 5.0 times 10 to the minus three moles is multiplied by one mole of H plus per one mole of HCl. So your concentration is the same, and then you take that concentration and you plug it into your pH formula. Negative the log of 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3 is equal to 2.3 pH. So this is a quite an acidic solution. So naturally, once we've established the nature of acids and bases, we can start talking about the reactions between them. The first and simplest of which is neutralization, where you have an acid and a base which react to one another to form salt and water. In this case, the H plus from the acid combines with the OH minus from the base to form water, and the properties of both reactants are neutralized. This salt will contain the positive ion from the base and the negative ion from the acid. So, for instance, the reaction of hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide, this is a double replacement reaction because you're switching the place of two ions. And it takes the form shown here. HCl aqueous plus NaOH aqueous yields NaCl aqueous and water. Now, in this case, HCl is the acid, NaOH is the base, NaCl is the salt, and water is water. The ionic equation for this reaction is quite simple because there is chloride and sodium ions on both sides meaning they cancel, and you have H plus plus OH minus equals water. Now, you can balance a neutralization reaction in the case where there are more than one hydroxide ions bound to a metal. So in the case of barium chloride reacting with HCl, you actually need to use two protons to neutralize both hydroxide ions so you have to uh, use two HCl molecules to neutralize one barium hydroxide molecule this produces the salt which 
It's BACL2. So in this case, chloride and barium combine together and leave behind the water in this double replacement reaction. So the neutralization of acids and bases can be used to determine acid or base concentration in an unknown solution in a process called titration, which is a fairly routine laboratory practice. Uh, pH only determines the amount of dissociated H plus in the solution. It will not give you the concentration of the other ions necessarily. Um, titration gives you the info about the total number of acid or base molecules present. So a titration is set up where you have one solution adding to another in fixed amounts until the sol solute in the first solution has reacted completely with the solute in the second solution. So you say you have in section A a precisely measured volume of acid that you don't know the concentration of. You place that acid in the flask and then you titrate it with a standard sodium hydroxide solution, which you know the concentration of. You have an initial and final volume reading, and you know that it becomes neutralized based on either a pH reading or an indicator reading. Usually an indicator is more easily um, noticed. pH readers can sometimes be inaccurate or too inaccurate for the precision that's required for a titration. Now, acid-based titrations take advantage of the fact that in a neutralization reaction, the number of moles of acid are equal to the number of moles of base. Unless you have two protons being exchanged, but that can just create a more complicated titration curve. Uh, the endpoint is reached when all of the acid has reacted with all of the base, and you have to know the original volume of the acid and the volume and concentration of the base in order to calculate the remaining unknown in the MV, M1V1 equals M2V2 equation, which is then leaves the concentration of the acid as the only unknown. And in a titration, it's important to always stop just at the endpoint because if you overshoot the endpoint, then you don't know how far over you've gone which will cause your number of moles to be inaccurate. So, now we're going to get on to the concept of salts and whether they form neutral, acidic, or basic solutions. So these are non, they're not necessarily acids or bases, but they can form acidic or basic solutions. Um, so salts that form neutral solutions are salts of where the, both the cation and anion are the conjugates of a strong acid or base. So these ions do not produce or attract H plus from water. They're too busy existing fully dissociated. An example of this is KNO3, potassium nitrate, which forms a neutral solution because it contains a cation from a strong base, KOH, and an anion, NO3, from a strong acid, which is HNO3. Now, if you have a salt solution that has ions from a weak acid and a strong base, then it will form a basic solution. Now, this has an anion of the weak acid that attracts H plus from water. And an example of this is um, potassium bicarbonate, which is potash. It forms a basic solution because its anion forms a weak acid, the weak acid being carbonic acid. But the cation is from a strong base, which is potassium hydroxide. Now, in this case, the anion of the weak acid, HCO3 minus, will interact with water to form the weak acid, carbonic acid, and a solution of OH minus, which will make this solution basic.
Now, there are other salts that form acidic solutions. So if it contains the ions of a strong acid and a weak base, then it will form an acidic solution because the cation of the weak base will produce H plus in water. An example of this is ammonium chloride, NH4Cl. This will form an acidic solution because it has the cation of a weak base, NH3+, and the anion of the strong acid, HCl. So NH4+, plus, plus water, will deprotonate to form H3O+, plus and ammonia. Uh, the ammonia is a weak base, and H3O+, plus makes the solution acidic. And there are a number of cations and anions that produce acidic, neutral, or basic solutions. Um, neutral solutions are formed by cations and anions of strong bases and acids, so lithium, sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, but not beryllium, beryllium special, these forming with the anions of chloride, bromide, iodide, nitrate, or chlorate perchlorate, um, strong bases, and weak acids. So any of those positively charged ions I just mentioned, making compounds with fluoride, nitrite, cyanide, carbonate, sulfate, acetate, sulfide, or phosphate. Um, and then... Weak bases such as NH4+, beryllium 2+, aluminum 3+, zinc 2+, chromium 3+, F or Fe3+, which are small, highly charged metal ions, making bond salts with any of the strong acid anions will have basic solutions. And so here are some examples sodium chloride magnesium bromide potassium nitrate will all form neutral solutions because they have cations and anions from strong bases and acids sodium fluoride magnesium carbonate potassium nitrate will form basic solutions because they have a cation from a strong base and anion from a weak acid and ammonium chloride iron bromide or aluminum nitrate will form acidic solutions because they have a cation from a weak base and an anion from a strong acid So, quick learning check. Predict whether a solution of each salt will be acidic, basic, or neutral. Lithium sulfide, magnesium nitrate, ammonium bromide. Um, lithium sulfide is basic because sulfide ions are the anions of weak acids. Its conjugate base is HS-, and it reacts with water to produce HS- and OH-, which Lithium is the cation of a strong base, so it does not interact with water, and therefore you have a basic solution. Magnesium nitrate is neutral because Mg2 plus is a cation of a strong base, and nitrate is an anion of a strong acid, and they do not, they do not deprotonate water. NH4Br is ammonium bromide. It is acidic because ammonium is a cation of a weak base, and it interacts with water to produce H3O plus. Br minus is an anion of a strong acid, and it does not interact with water. So now, the, a useful application of this process of forming weak salts from weak acids and bases is that you can make buffers out of them. So when you have pure water and you add either um, hydronium or hydroxide ions to it, the pH will change drastically. Um, however, if you have a buffer solution, which has a which holds its pH steady, you it's harder to change the pH with the same addition of acid or base. And the reason for this is um, because of the use of conjugate acid-base pairs. So buffer is useful in your body to absorb to absorb H3O plus or OH minus from foods and cellular processes while maintaining a constant pH. This is important for the proper functioning of your blood and cells. Uh, and in your body, the blood maintains a pH close to 7.4, and small changes in this can severely impact the uptake of oxygen and the elimination of carbon dioxide. A buffer is composed of an acid-base conjugate pair, and 
it can either be a weak acid and a salt of its conjugate base or a weak base and a salt of its conjugate acid and it will typically have equal concentrations of each so quick um, learning check based on what we just talked about which can you use to make a buffer and which can you not uh, hydrochloric acid and potassium chloride um, a carbonic acid and sodium bicarbonate phosphoric acid and sodium chloride or acetic acid and potassium acetate so the first one is cannot be a buffer solution because HCl is a strong acid and it needs to be a weak acid to make a buffer carbonic acid and sodium bicarbonate is a conjugate acid based pair because it is a weak acid and it's salt Phosphoric acid and sodium chloride is not a conjugate acid base pair and therefore cannot be used to make a buffer. And acetic acid and potassium acetate is a acid base conjugate pair, so it can be used to make a buffer. So a buffer acts to neutralize added acid or base and reestablish an equilibrium between the two. So if you have acetic acid mixed with sodium acetate, um, this will increase the amount of acetate ion in the solution um, because the dissociation of acetic acid produces acetate ion and also the dissociation of sodium acetate produces acetate ion. So there will be a higher concentration of the conjugate base than in the weak acid alone, which will generally cause the reverse reaction to be favored. <clears throat> so the function of the weak acid in this case is to neutralize added base. So when base is added, this the acetic acid will be deprotonated to produce the acetate ion this will in turn neutralize the OH minus ions that are added uh, this will produce the acetate ion in water which will increase the concentration of acetate and decrease the concentration of acetic acid now likewise the acetate ion will neutralize any added H3O plus ions to produce water and the water and acetic acid. So the concentration of acetate will go down and the concentration of acetic acid will go up. In both cases, a new equilibrium will be established to compensate for the added OH minus or H3O plus ions. But because the, um, the two are acid-base pairs, the pH will remain the same because the relative ratio of them is still the same. So in order to calculate the pH of a buffer, you start with constructing the Ka expression, the acid dissociation constant. This refers to the equilibrium of the process of dissociation. So you have weak acid plus water yields H3O plus and conjugate base. The acid con dissociation constant is the H3O plus concentration times the conjugate base concentration divided by the weak acid concentration. And in order to solve for the H3O plus concentration to calculate your pH, you rearrange to put the acid dissociation constant on the same side as the weak acid and the conjugate base. So we always do this in a step-by-step -step manner. We start by writing our expression. We rearrange for the Ka or Kb value for H3O+, and then substitute the concentrations that we know, and then calculate the pH using the H3O plus concentration. So, in the case of, say, the weak acid H2PO4 minus in a buffer with H2PO4 minus and HPO4 
2 minus. This is the deprotonated form of that. This has a Ka of 6.2 times 10 to the minus h. So what is the pH of this buffer? If we have 0.2 molar of both the acid and its conjugate base, um, if we start by writing out our equilibrium expression, which as we know is products divided by reactants, so we have conjugate base in the numerator and weak acid in the denominator, we rearrange solving for the H3O plus concentration, and then we plug in our values. So we have 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8 for our Ka. We have the same concentration of both acid and conjugate base. And so the concentration of H3O plus is then just 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And the pH is negative the log of this, which is equal to 7.21. 7.21 is a nearly neutral solution, but it is slightly basic. And this solution will hold a roughly constant pH if more of either H plus or OH minus is added. So um, we're going to do another example here. What is the pH of a carbonic acid buffer that is 0.2 molar H2CO3 and 0.1 molar HCO3 minus? So the Ka for this expression is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7. So first we write out our equilibrium expression. So we know that the conjugate base is HCO3 minus and the weak acid is H2CO3. And so our expression is this. We rearrange to solve for H3O plus. And then we put our values in 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7 times 0 0.20 divided by 0 0.10 is equal to 8.6 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. And negative the log of this is 6.07 so this is slightly acidic and um, your blood will probably have a mixture of these two processes happening in it at most times so this is the end of acids and bases I'm also going to, I'm going to be posting a quiz for the equilibrium material this week and then next week there will be a quiz for the acid base material and then the final exam will be posted probably by the end of that week we have two more labs to do before the end of the semester and I also will post an organic primer lecture for anybody who's interested um, there probably won't be more than one or two questions on the final about that material so don't worry too much about it just peruse it at your leisure and um, keep in uh, keep on the lookout for the rest of the assignments. The end of the semester is officially the 15th of August, um, and I can't post grades much later than that, so I would encourage you all to finish all of the classwork by that time.